curious to uh, to try this new experience. And now uh, he is ready to share with us his personal love of sound and uh, his ideas how the future world will look like with um, connected devices. What would it be and what could it be? Glenn, please tell us about that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming, and I just want to say it's a real honor to be here in St. Petersburg with the conference uh, speaking. So let me... So the title of the talk, Microphones and Speakers Are Everywhere, What Next? And I wanted to get to that by way of sort of weaving through a story, uh, a story of myself and the personal history and experience that I've had with sound. And also talk a little bit about sound and spatial sound design in games. And I guess from a perspective of someone who's been very involved in the mechanics of spatial sound and spatial acoustics, offering advice on how to achieve a good spatial sound experience. But then moving forward and focusing on this the technology, the platform that we have. And I guess if we look in the room, in our pockets, everyone has a microphone, one if not two microphones, and around us on our bodies, we're carrying many speakers. So this idea of microphones and speakers as perhaps a more orchestrated resource is the thesis of the talk. So I wanted to start with a game console. This was my first game console. So that's by way of saying those who remember the sort of P50 and early uh, Pong emulators. Uh, it's probably my way of saying that I've been around for a while. So when it comes to audio and games, I have experience. Whether that uh, amounts to knowledge or not is really up to the audience. But certainly, from my perspective, sound and games has been very important. So if I take it back to the mid-80s, my brother, um, it's about my size, and he's two years older than I, and he was immensely curious about electronics. He started fixing televisions when he was 12. But with his first paycheck, when he started working in an apprenticeship, he started buying audio equipment. This here is a lovely turntable from Lynn, which was one of his proudest purchases. And with him buying this sort of equipment, wonderful JBL speakers, I got to listen to audio at a quality that was just amazing. Even now, I remember the songs, the tunes, the intonation, the emotion that comes from audio. And I really had a connection with audio. But of course, that was my older brother. And he was into analog audio and turntables, so I had to look for something a bit different. So my parents bought me a portable tape cassette player. Now, portable audio was something amazing. Portable audio you could carry with you. But unfortunately, the mechanics of the portable tape player meant that tiny mechanisms that had to fit on your waist were responsible for managing the continuity and cleanliness and, I guess, the precision of the audio that was being played back. And that was by, by no means a match for the large platter turntable that I'd heard with my brother. And to anyone who would listen, I'd complain that the tape was wandering and the pitch was changing. No one else really seemed to notice this as much as it annoyed me. And I guess that was another sign that hearing and, and pitch perception was something I was particularly attuned to. But then something happened. Something found its way to the part of Australia, Geelong, where I grew up. It took a little bit longer than the rest of the world, but in about 1987, 1988, I first saw the CD player. And while my parents were away at holidays, I went out and took out my sort of piggy bank savings from school and bought a CD player. Now, they weren't at all happy, when they came home, but I must say that digital audio and the way it has changed my life has certainly been worthwhile. But see, what was different about digital audio was the sense that audio was represented by numbers. Audio had a precise way of being duplicated, but perhaps more important, unlike the turntable and unlike the cassette player, digital audio meant that we were replaying audio to the heartbeat and the regular heartbeat of a tiny crystal. That precision and reproduction was something that had sound purity and clarity, which I was really taken by. So digital audio could be precise, could be portable. And that really led me to go on and study engineering. So I studied the, I guess, electronic engineering in the area of what's called signals and systems. And at the same time as I was studying, we saw products such as this come out on the market. And this was taking audio a step further. Once you've got audio represented as numbers, 
you can actually go a step forward and manipulate it. Of course, whether you want to or not, and whether people manipulate it well is a different topic of conversation. But what I saw in the market was the ability to take audio and create an impression of space, to take music and make it sound like, in the case of this device, that it was being played in, say, a jazz club or concert hall. So this was very exciting because I was studying the tools and technology in order to manipulate signals, and we were seeing the emergence of technology to allow this to happen. So I set a pretty bold goal that I was going to build things the world listened to, even from the part of the Australia where I came and sort of moving into a technology and area that was very new to myself and the family. And so sometimes when you have a goal like that, if you throw yourself open, serendipity has a way of helping. So digital audio can be manipulated. That was sort of a message that was clear at that stage. But what to do with it? How to start a career in digital audio? I started working in Australia for a startup company called Lake, and I was the part of a very small team. And what we were doing then was what we now know as convolutional audio. In fact, it was still known as convolutional audio then. It's just far more familiar to people. When I started working at Lake in 1996, we were running digital filters with 20-second impulse responses and no latency at all. In fact, the same filters and same performance we see now. And this here that I'm on the right, that's a VR system. So whilst at home I was playing Turok and you know, on, on sort of the Nintendo 64, at work we got to play with $15 million VR systems. So to me, VR is not anything new. VR actually, and particularly the audio of VR, has been largely unchanged for nearly 20 years. But what was interesting about VR initially is that virtual reality systems were being constructed by groups, science and defense, to experiment on people. Virtual reality was initially led as a psychology experiment to see how we react to alternate realities presented in our visual and auditory senses. So, what did virtual reality look like? And one of the applications, you know, a great screenshot from back there, obviously the graphics was quite a bit different. Uh, but this was an uh, interactive communication system that linked between MIT, uh, British Telecom in the UK, and Lake Technology in Australia. So we had interactive communication using spatial audio across three continents, and this was in the late 90s. And the sound was very much something that we worked on in the rendering. But if I jump forward 15 years, I'd now like to just sort of show as an example of this same technology. This is the Dolby conference phone. Um, it's a spatial surround sound conference phone. Uh, it's advertised and is notably the best experience in audio conferencing for business meetings. But what this is to me is an embodiment of the game. It's an embodiment of the virtual reality systems and work from 20 years, audio virtual reality put into a product. And so across that time, I guess I can offer what I learned to create a spectacular audio experience in the form of this phone. And oddly enough, but perhaps not surprisingly in hindsight, is that in order to have a spectacular spatial sound experience, you have to make sure that the user and listener doesn't notice the spatial sound. Now, we don't go around the world going, oh, wow, I'm hearing spatial sound. In fact, when spatial sound is working correctly, our brain is in a processing mode where we don't notice the spatial acoustics specifically. Now, this is interesting, and I want to take this forward and sort of present it in a way and some comments that would be useful for game design. Because we shouldn't seek out spatial audio as something that is amazing and high impact and increasingly developing it will somehow get us to where we want. From my experience, to create a system that's truly amazing that utilizes spatial audio, we have to make it seem effortless. And so digital audio can be manipulated, and it's very exciting to manipulate digital audio. And we learned this in many ways, particularly in VR a long time ago. But mastering audio should seem effortless. The listener shouldn't be paying attention to the processing that they hear in audio. And this is particularly important when we're bringing a lot of different sounds in, both sound assets and in real time. We have to find a way to create the audio assets so that they seem natural and compelling. So, how to create gracial sound experiences. And I've given a few tips, I guess, going in, that spatial audio is part of the technology. 
Now, of course, those who know me would say I could easily talk for days, if not weeks, about spatial audio. And probably a detailed technical presentation on aspects of spatial audio is not something I should go into in the scope of this talk, but I'm always happy to take that up in another circumstance. So what I wanted to do, though, is give some impression, I guess some guidance of someone who's really worked on the spatial audio side, but seen where we see awesome spatial audio experiences coming out in practice, in virtual reality, and in gaming. First of all, here's a model. This is a way we can sort of think about the creativity aspect. A game design or a story design is a brain. We're imagining a reality that we want to convey. So the media that we put things into is a way of conveying it, but the imagination that exists in the author's brain is the starting point. And one model of sound is that by getting the sound right at the eardrum, by stimulating the eardrum precisely, we can map our imagination to someone else's mind. But unfortunately, stimulating the eardrum does not stimulate the imagination directly. It's not kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. And so striving to fixate on just the sound at the ears is not necessarily the right way or the only way to create. However, this way of thinking is very popular for engineering. It's very popular for writing about sound. It's very popular for scientific reductionist experiments. But we can learn a lot from whether it works or not. We can learn that if we create reality in sound, then it's going to sound like reality. In a lot of cases, what we imagine is going to be much more than reality. We also know that if we hear something that doesn't match what we're doing, we may not interpret it the way we think. Perception actually is primarily recall. Perception is imagination, it's memories. So this model may seem like a good way forward, but ultimately it leads to a lot of technology. Technology filters audio processing for audio processing's sake. So there's a lot of detail on this slide that's not particularly important. What is important is these are diagrams from two patents that date about 20 years apart, one from myself and colleagues in the late 90s, and ones that are more recently. So whilst there might be a sense that spatial sound is being invented and being pioneered right now, particularly for things like binaural, I guess as one of the inventors of Dolby Headphone myself, it's been around for a long while. And when we have a look at spatial sound engines, the same filtering, the same convolution, room impulse responses, technical detail that I won't get into, but panning, higher order ambisonics, we're actually using all those in the virtual reality systems back in the day. So, has anything really changed in the technology? Well, perhaps not in the acoustic modeling. Perhaps not in the way, even back in 96, we were using packages to accurately model the impulse responses and acoustics of real rooms. But I think we all know what has changed is the size. So between the, the $15 million piece of equipment that did a VR workstation with sort of stick bubble figures, 5 million times smaller, 1,000 times faster, 5,000 times less expensive, fits in your pocket and runs in battery. So something that is now far more accessible and will run thousands of sources. But does that get us to what we want? So if the techniques in spatial audio can now be applied smaller, faster, more accessible, well, from those that have read and looked at many games, just having more sounds can actually lead you down a slippery slope towards the cacophony of game sound, which is probably not what we want either. So, the spatial sound fundamentals have been consistent and the processing is now abundant. And a spatial sound engine is something very important, something we will use in games. But here's another analogy of connecting two brains. What can we learn from other forms of expression? For example, if we take the writing as a form of expression, I would say that despite 500 years since the printing press, no book has been a bestseller because it has a very accurate font. It's the stories, it's the encapsulation. Sometimes it's what we don't do that allows the imagination of the receiver to create a more compelling impression. And the same with, even in the name, impressionist painting. We see that an image that doesn't necessarily contain fidelity, and by no means would we worry about the accuracy of the pigments, but the way it's portrayed offers a different approach for conveying meaning, information, and imagination between two minds. So stimulating the eardrum precisely is not enough. Stimulating the imagination is what we want to achieve. But what's some tips? How does this fit into game design? Well, 
I wanted to say, what could go wrong? What could go wrong if we went down the path of really accurate and righteous architectural and you know, rendering acoustics? First off, and these seem maybe simple in hindsight, and I think many people who've worked in audio might know these, but it's worth going through as a refresher to realize just how many times we have to break the rules. First of all, imagine a gunshot in your hand. If you weren't wearing hearing protection, you would be deaf. If we could simulate that gunshot in a game engine, the neighbors would be very upset. If you were firing a gun without hearing protection, well, let's say you have hearing protection, then you wouldn't hear the action far away. So immediately in games, we want to hear dynamic range and distance effects, which are far different to what we would see in reality. So we have to break the rules. If we think in situations of dialogue clarity, even now in this room, I have to use a PA system to sort of be clearly heard. But in games, we want to naturally be able to hear voice and dialogue that's important. Would it be interesting if we created the exact acoustics of a conference room in which we're having a meeting, only to find out that that conference room was a particularly bad room for acoustics? Should we then simulate acoustic treatments in the room to make it a better conference room? Or perhaps there's a faster way. Perhaps we need to break the rules. Perhaps we need to not have acoustic, accurate acoustic rendering as our only tool. Delay is very interesting. And I know people that have worked in, in, in sound design would, would know this. Explosions in the distance, we don't expect to hear a delay, even though that would happen in practice. So things moving in a righteous acoustic engine should have delay based on distance. But maybe that's not what we want. Sometimes we want delay without Doppler. Sometimes we want Doppler without delay. Again, we're breaking the rules. A point of view in game is not restricted to one point. And if it were, would we really want to hear the sound as if we're in the audience when we have a rock constant point of view? There's so many situations. Would we want to hear a car sound from a helicopter when that's the correct point of view? So we'll see very quickly in game engines that you immediately have to maintain multiple perspectives, multiple points of view. This is valuable. It's artistic styling. But again, it's breaking the rules. So all these things are sort of stacking up to say, gee, to fixate on having something acoustically high detail, righteous spatial engine to only break the rules. Maybe there's another way. Maybe there's a way of more stylistic acoustic rendering. Room consistency. Psychologically, when we hear a room that we're not sitting in, it creates a perceptual incongruence in our mind. And what you'll also find is there's a desire to take reverb and change it on a per source basis. So again, we need to start to, excuse me, break the rules there. And last, dogs and physics. Now, I'll use the example of a dog simply because we know dogs can hear in higher frequencies than we can. But even at 10 kilohertz, at a 7 millimeter wave, the extent to which our gaming environment to be accurate would need to have nuances of detail that simply aren't possible to model now. And maybe we don't need to. Already, we need to break the rules at high frequencies to create the audio scenes that we're used to. So they're the things that could go wrong, and in a way, you learn to break the rules. You learn to use a game engine and a spatial audio engine to get you part the way there, but then you use it in a way that allows you to break the rules. And we could call this breaking the rules, but that would be something that comes from the perspective of a fixation on acoustics as being the tool that's needed, an accurate modeling of acoustics. But are we really breaking the rules, or are we allowing creative style to be part of the process? So I think it's most certainly the latter. So here's some design tips, I guess, from experience. First and foremost, it doesn't matter how sophisticated the tools are that you use to create spatial audio, the impact and quality of the assets and sources are paramount. So the number of times I've created a demonstration that has awesome computational complexity, thinking I was clever as an engineer, to realize that someone who could just come in with a good recording of some source material could, could blow that away. So certainly, measuring sources in the right way to be combined. For those that understand, uh, in an acoustic engine, the idea is that you have a recording of the source as if it was anechoic. And that would mean every sound that you're interested in, you'd have to take somewhere in the middle of nowhere, wrap it in microphones, and infer the sound at the origin. Technical detail, but you get the point that putting a microphone near something doesn't give you the sound that you need for the game or for the spatial audio engine. So recording is a skill. 
and recording sounds that are not always the sounds of reality, but the sounds we want and need and expect in games. A spatial engine, a spatial rendering engine, I would say the important criteria to me are that it be plausible and perceptually continuous. So let me explain those terms. Plausible means that I can plausibly believe there's a spatial sound. It, it reasonably has the cues that we expect at the ears and of the room to exist somewhere. Now, provided there's enough other, other cues, visual cues or interactive cues, plausibility is what we need to start engaging our spatial auditory sound system in the brain. And perceptual continuity means that we don't break the illusion. You can imagine that if I turned my head and the sound jumped. So perceptual continuity is this idea that things smoothly move around when objects come and go, when they move behind occlusions, that we get gradual changes, not sudden jumps. So this is particularly important, not that a spatial engine is completely correct, because we're going to want to break the rules and stylize it, but a spatial audio engine needs to give us this continuity, this soft and continued expression of spatial sound processing. I think loudness is very important, and this now has become very much a part of all good game engines, that we can manage loudness in a way where the sound sources are prioritized. Reverb, the ability to bring in structural detail and reverb and style, I think is an important aspect of a sound engine. But not just to pull that from the graphics engine and your graphics model, to actually be able to grab the handles and play with the reverb to get the style that you need, to be able to play with sounds individually. Not every sound we want to layer with the same reverb. Generally, we want voices to be drier than effects. Self-noise is a particularly big one. I mean, wherever we are, if we make a sound, it cues us in on the environment. If we can make an interactive sound, it's like an action inquiry. We create a response or a question to the environment and hear it. So self-noise and bringing that in with game actions or even voice is important. And finally, input cleaning. Please don't think that somehow a headset of a user out in the field is going to bring in sound as good as the dialogue you've recorded from professional actors. I think it's, it's shame when, at the last moment, interactive voice is, some, is turned on in some way in a game only to hear avatars running around with background noise leaking through. So just note that it is a large challenge. It's something that I've personally worked on a lot and was critical to our conferencing system. But input cleaning for games, live microphone, is not going to give you the same as studio voice. So think about how you're going to use it. Think about how it's included. And plan early for what it's going to sound like with your real users. So the three things put together, plausibility, that's what engages our hearing system. I hear spatial sound. Functionality means that goal-oriented behavior enables our brain and plasticity to adapt to the audio rendering engine. And in fact, the audio processing machine of our minds can adapt to learn and utilize an audio system quite powerfully. Great research from Barbara Shin Cunningham that shows that when we have goal-oriented behavior, the functionality of audio excites plasticity. So people will learn your style of spatial audio. And finally, perceptual continuity, avoiding distraction, avoiding things that come in to break the illusion. And if you can put time into something, putting time into removing and pushing down the perceptual continuity issues is very important. Plausibility, I think we can get from any good spatial engine. Functionality is about the game design and how you use sound. And perceptual continuity is about noticing where people notice the audio. The point when someone remarks about the audio is the point where you've probably done something wrong. So digital audio can be manipulated. Mastering audio should seem effortless. And precision is not always necessary and rarely sufficient. If we're imagining something more than reality, we shouldn't limit ourselves to just creating reality. But I wanted to go on. What does the future look like? What's something that's important in audio going forward? Well, I think we could all agree that we have a generation now that's far more amenable to carrying and using headphones. So headphones are a very important source, uh, a destination, I guess, for delivering audio. But headphones aren't considered as a connected device yet. And we have the idea of sort of connected AR devices with vision, but I don't think we're quite ready for Borg accessories yet in everyday life. So what would it look like if headphones were more connected? 
Well, we see this now. We see a huge explosion of moving away from your isolated full range headphones, which will still have the best sound quality, but devices that I've listed a few here, nothing specific or no specific relationship to Dolby, but just a few iconic versions of products that will run for 10 to 12 hours in your ear. They are connected and they involve or have an ability to pass through audio from the outside. So these are, I guess, a new platform that's coming forward. Think of rather than just your user being accessible or their ears being accessible when they're in the game, think of a game player who has their ears accessible throughout the day. Think of systems that will manage audio messages more seamlessly. And of course, we also have a set of devices which are very transparent. Um, this is a beautiful one here, the Ego that pops in the ear. Or also devices like Pinna Effect. So you can see that there will be, in the future, headphones or audio signaling devices that we can have continually present. At the moment, I don't think we have applications that warrant us wearing these headphones and having them connected all the time. But this will start to change. Much as it seems strange that you would ever want to carry a phone with you, and now we find that hard to think it could have ever been different. I think in the future it may seem strange that our ears are constantly connected online, but in future that will seem like it would have been inevitable. So we have a convergence of devices. And this is, in addition to headphones, speakers and microphones are all around us. What does it mean if we're surrounded by microphones, but every microphone is almost like a different microphone on a different lead to a different consumer? But they're all connected. So can we bring these together in a way where the microphones work in unison, where the microphones somehow can help us pick up sound better of the person and the environment, understand the context long term? And we're surrounded by speakers, but not necessarily surround sound speakers. So think about the pervasive audio connectivity we can get if finally the audio in our cars, in our pockets, in our homes, in our TVs worked in unison. So this is a stretch of the imagination to see how we could go from speakers and microphones that are treated individually. But I believe in a future where we can have the orchestration idea where ultimately sound is a desire to connect to someone's ears or listen to someone's voice. And the devices form more of a democratized infrastructure. And we're seeing that start to happen with standards in 3GPP and MPEG and also Bluetooth. The idea of device orchestration devices working together to capture and play media. And we're going to see devices turn up. Uh, these are some great examples. I tried to find, I guess, the, the, the stretch, the oddest thing, and it was a rubbish bin from Simple Human that has actually a speaker and a microphone built in. So I guess it's the, the rush to have everything voice activated. But another example there is from Light Freak, which is a light bulb that has a speaker and microphone. So the Internet of Things is bringing devices out. It doesn't cost very much to add speakers and microphones. How will we use them? It'll be very integrated into our lifestyles. It won't be sort of avert devices. It'll be very blended. Um, but imagine audio that knows what we prefer, when we prefer to get our messages, how we'd like to be notified, in something that is very different to what we see now, something that's far more personalized, and not just for the benefit of enabling consumption. So some quick numbers, if we look at the number of tweets or Google searches and translate that to words, how many words a second? So if there's 800 Instagram uploads a second of photos, and let's say a picture's 1,000 words, so 800,000 words there. But that doesn't even come close when we think about 6 billion people, 16,000 words a day. So that's 1 billion words a second. And pretty much all of those words at the moment from this planet are somewhere near a microphone. What's the killer application? I don't know. But for those who know Charles Stross, an excellent science fiction reporter, I think this to me is a really iconic example. He talks about a game called Spooks. And the premise of Spooks is you sign up to this game, and at some point within your life, through any day, you don't know when, but you'll be contacted by phone or by a message over audio and asked to carry out a small mission. You spend your life thinking every now and again you have to be clandestine, you be a spy. And it's a fantastic analogy of a game that's played out in the real world that only has messaging, that behind it is a gaming system that's controlling people for fun and maybe even for social good, that our missions could actually be benefiting. So for those, I encourage the read, but you know, to think of a, an application where our audio accessibility becomes uh, a very exciting prospect for gameplay itself. 
But generally, so these billion words a second, we can think of the possibility of the orchestrated devices as almost a, an assistant, a note taker, someone who listens to everything we say, takes notes, has them organized for our recall. And we can think of a orchestrated environment allowing us to seamlessly call and contact people. So this sort of utopian future, a beautiful sense where it's wonderful that all our words are heard and other people's. All our meetings are recorded and accessible. But we can immediately jump to the idea of a security force or an oppressive force listening to all those words, and what would that mean? And the idea of our ears being accessible to anyone or anything based on preferences and, you know, it's like the opposite of a search engine where the optimization of people trying to get audio through to your ears and break through your spam filters. So connectivity has obviously a, a dark side as well. And what you could even worry about or be more concerned about is the idea of not people listening, but artificial intelligence listening, and what does it want? So there's a lot to think about here. I think what is important is we could aspire for a democratization of, of capture, capture and this accessibility of our ears. There's technological aspects and challenges to orchestrate devices, but imagine if it were possible. What would it mean about gameplay if instead of writing sound for a device or sound for one situation, you think about the delivery of audio information to and from a user, and that's woven throughout their whole day. Now, I really do think games have a great way of showing technology in a positive view, of showing technology that can be used for entertainment. And often we see games that start of a technology experiment and then move towards entertainment and actually lead towards teaching and expansion. And so games in this orchestrated audio environment could be quite important. So I want to just leave with some closing thoughts. This has been um, my journey through audio. And I guess some tips around how the focus that I had even about spatial audio didn't turn out to be the most important thing. So spatial audio engines weren't the most important thing in creating great spatial sound. But going forward, what I wanted you to think about or even open a discussion is what will it mean when all our devices are connected and audio is something that is far more pervasive in playback and far more integrated in capture? How will we manage this as a society we're already in a post-privacy world. The microphones are already there in your pocket. Someone already has access to them. But maybe by demanding and creating positive applications of this technology, we can steer it in a good direction. So thank you so much for your time. So questions and... Thank you. This one? Yeah, this one works. Okay. So, two microphones and, <laughs> yeah, already too many. So, thank you so much, Glenn. Okay. Uh, guys, uh, you, we are ready for our traditional Q&A session, so you're welcome. And please speak on the microphone or no one will hear you. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, thank you. I really was, became interested in, do you know any games that are actually realistic in uh, sound design? I mean, uh, you said about uh, the, uh, the delays, the, the effects that are added to make more, more beautiful sound. But do you know any games that are really realistic where we have delays between the explosion and the sound, where we have that effects that are maybe not as cool, not, don't mm. sound as great, but they make realism? I, I'd have to answer that. Probably with a direct no, I don't know any games. Um, other than the ones that I've made along the way myself and others have, have made, to realize that if you really accurately simulate reality, you get reality. <laughs> and, and reality is actually pretty boring com compared to what a game would be. And I think, in fact, I would say that almost any game creates in some form artistic license, even as soon as you've got a punch or a gunshot. Um, and we can see realism in scripted. Like, even if, if we could record with a simple microphone real action and point of view, I don't think people even want to watch reality that's recorded <laughs> with a real microphone. So, no, I, I, I think there's efforts to simulate uh, sound very accurately, and I think there are some instances, particularly in the early psychology experimentation where we did, where we worked very hard to create realistic 
you know, sort of, but they were just fundamentally underwhelming. When you recreate reality, you get reality. Anyone else? Can you, I don't know if Dolby is working on anything like this, but um, can you foresee um, any scenarios or anything that comes to mind where, to, to even follow up on the reality thing, where you will be pushing a completely synthesized type of audio to people um, that they either want or get used to it? I'm, and, and, I, and in terms of like, this is not reality, it's not going to be, but I know that this is a communication device and therefore I want this. Right. Um, well, I would say yes, the Dolby conference phone uh, creates something which is uh, a combination of uh, real audio processed in a way that's stylized and creates what is a sense of um, a plausible reality. Now, when people comment about it, they will say, it sounds real, I thought I was in the room. So all the comments we get about the Dolby conference phone come from the perception of being clear and real. But as the designer, it, it's, it's very different to that underneath, and in fact, it can't be real because we're creating an imaginary situation of people coming from very different spaces and coming together. So I think that the Dolby conference phone is an example where we've created something that isn't necessarily real, but people believe it's real. They function in it in a realistic way. And it's that, that trinity of the plausibility, you know, the functionality and the perceptual continuity. Uh, but as a designer, it's fascinating when people say something like, wow, that sounded real. And what's amazing is sometimes when you create that sound that people believe is real, it could be anything but. But I think to your question, and, and perhaps if I get at the heart of your question, has Dolby ever been involved in creating something uh, which is sort of structured audio that people want to believe and even come to accept as real? And I think, yes, absolutely, movie sound is that example. And movie sound has quite an intricate link with game sound. Do you know? The number of times that cars actually make a tire squeal as they pull away in real life is incredibly small. But yet, if we see in games and movies a car pulling away, we expect it to squeal. So in fact, we've created for ourselves in some content already a language of sound, which is a cartoonification. And I think this will continue. And if we look at a lot of other areas, cartoons can be more powerful than reality at conveying messages. Cartoons can be faster at drawing attention to what we want to give attention. So yeah, I mean, a great question. I think going back to movies was stylized. The conference phone uh, certainly is something where we create a stylized. But when people connect to something and they believe it's real, it ignites their imagination and their cognitive processes of understanding. And it would be a shame if we thought the only way of doing that was to have the exact sensors created. Thank you. Well, do I have anyone else here? So guys, if you hesitate to ask questions in English, you're more than welcome to do this in Russian. I'll try to translate it correctly. Uh, hi, my name is Dmitry, I'm working in Wargaming. So it's uh, not so much technical question, it's just uh, wondering. Uh, do you know about game uh, Hellblade Senior's Sacrifice? The game? Uh, this is a game about, uh, I don't know, a girl who have a mental illness and uh, he hear uh, voices in her head. And uh, uh, game developers, um, spent a lot of time to, on sound design and uh, I just uh, want to know if you know this game and just I, I want to hear uh, expert opinion and uh, US uh, audio engineer and so Yeah, on. no I, I, I don't directly but you have intrigued me and I will check it out. Let's uh, open a dialogue, um, you know, jot down my email and shoot me an email. I'll play through it and have a listen and we'll have a chat. Okay. Thank you. Dolby is clearly like the most ubiquitous name in high fidelity audio entertainment systems. Um, 
without breaking your NDA, can you speak to any type of psychoacoustic research you guys are going to maybe look way far down the road as to how we're going to be able to kind of eliminate some of these steps of recording and playing back audio to people? Because, I mean, the concept of using a microphone as a transducer to turn sound into electricity and then to use that electricity to turn it back into sound via speaker, yep. theoretically, we could bypass the speaker stage entirely, right? And our brains can interpret that electricity possibly into unknown sonic territories, right? Yep. Is there any research being done on that, or do you have any comments or speculations uh, about where that could head? What I... You know, and, and differently around, I guess my role in the company is often to be exploratory in areas and thinking. So I'll offer some things which I think are, uh, you know, somewhat integrated to Dolby, but also exploratory. Um, and I think at this stage, it'll be a while before we see microphones and speakers dis disappear. Uh, we're a long way from being able to inject anything directly uh, into the auditory nerve uh, that, it, that sort of matches what the brain hears. And I think there's a huge amount of, of research into this. So research into um, the psychology, psychology of hearing and perception, in my mind, actually peaked in around about the, the 60s and 70s before computers came along. Um, and now we're seeing a resurgence. And the reason is in the 60s and 70s, people would experiment with sound, with rich, amazing sound. But scientific reductionist and signal processing kind of got in the way for a while. Now we're seeing virtual reality and brain science actually looking at what the brain's doing, having, having a resurgence of that. But we're a long way from being able to inject sound in any meaningful way into the brain. And this is really being understood now more than ever because of the feedback nature of the ear. So it's one thing to think of the ear as like a microphone that connects to the brain through a wire. But actually, I don't know if, if people are aware of it, there's a thing called autoacoustic emissions. Right? So our ears actually make sound. Right? And it's not just a reflection. It's not like when sound comes into the ear, it gets echoed back. What actually happens is sound comes in the ear, goes up the brain stem, and efferent afferent activities push it back down, and our ear sings back. And these sorts of things, uh, when we think about it, the interface between the brain, the ear and the brain, is bidirectional. So our ability to send signals to the brain in a meaningful way is challenged by our ability to create something that responds to the brain the same way the ear does. And so if we send in signals without listening to what's coming back from the brain, it's almost like a, a bi-directional protocol. So I think in that sense, speakers and transducers will be around for a long time. Speakers and transducers closer to the ears are obviously something that's important, which is why I had a few slides up around there. Uh, and that is of interest. I think my work on Dolby Headphone and creating binaural rendering, um, and a lot of things, about every 10 years, people think about individualization of HRTFs again and say that it's all about the individualization. And, but there are many aspects of how we view sound, but ultimately sound is a weaker sense in terms of anchoring on other things. So in augmented reality and virtual reality, if we see something and it's plausible that that makes a sound and we get it approximate, then we believe it. So I think in some sense, rather than um, doing away with it, there'll be a, a continued need to record sounds in a meaningful way. I don't think sound recording and the skill of that is going to go away. Uh, there's synthetic aspects and generational, but Still, because if we want a sound palette that's richer than reality, you know, there'll be a combination of recording and synthesis, and definitely transduces the delivery of sound for the foreseeable future for people who have had hearing and have functional ears, the delivery of sound via pressure waves is, is not something we'll see replaced quickly, you know, at the fidelity we, we expect. Uh, maybe not really a gaming question so much, um, and also not, not necessarily about human hearing, but so uh, uh, um, self-driving cars and that sort of thing are, are, you know, coming of age. And, you know, we hear a lot about computer vision as being a component of that. Uh, how, much, how much does sound uh, as an input to, you know, AI or especially self-driving cars, is, uh, is that a component that, that's being utilized to... Mm. Hey, yeah, look, that, that's a really good question. I mean, I do have 
uh, you know, other activities I've had involved in computer vision, and I have a hand in that. But if I if I understand your question, it would be: is is audio as a sense being used in self-driving cars? And and you know yeah, the think yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think generally, probably not. You know, the reliance on vision in it would be quite high. Um, maybe in some alert systems. Certainly, I've I've been looking at the um, audio interface within the car. What does it mean for the passengers in the car to hear alarms? But artificial intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of work on artificial hearing. You know, will we see a revolution in artificial listening the same way we saw in vision? And the answer to that is obviously yes, with the right arrays. Um, the one thing with vision compared to audio is uh, there's a piece of silicon um, in, a, in a camera that does an amazing amount of MIPS, huge amount of MIPS that are very hard to replicate in audio, and that's called the lens. And a lens takes directional information from vision and actually maps it to a directional plane which is amenable for signal processing. What we don't have yet is that same ability in an audio space to map at that level of complexity. So audio scene analysis, audio beamforming, those activities are starting to interpret sound. But vision did have the advantage of having sort of a one-to-one -one relationship with what was out there and a processing plane. Whereas audio, there's a great textbook, I think it described audio as, it would be like looking at the waves coming into a harbor and saying what was happening out in the ocean. So the processing that happens in the lens of a camera is not well matched from the processing we can now do with a microphone array. We would need much higher density microphone arrays, which are coming, you know, much higher density processing, so we can sort of spatially decompose the scene. Exactly. And the thing with hearing, I, I think what's, what's amazing is when we look at vision, we can tune to something, and, and what we see in our fovea is with correspondence of optical. But when we hear, my, my statement is we, we don't really hear sound. What happens is after the fact, we're left with a memory that something acoustic happened that we can name or understand. So, and you can actually see this in a lot of experiments where people will you can leave sounds out of a sentence, and people will believe they heard a sound that's rewritten in history based on what the sentence, how it ends. So the classic example is some experiments where, for example, you would say, the whale was on the table, or the whale was on the cart. And people actually can say they heard meal or wheel, even though that information was never there. So the idea that we, we don't hear sounds, we imagine what we thought happened is really interesting. We're now at the point there's a, a deep or wave net uh, Google's been playing with. We actually have deep neural net or deep networks now that start to hallucinate sound. So what will be really interesting is once we see neural networks start hallucinating spatial sound, as in finding the plausible set of things that they believe happened, which is it's kind of different to vision analysis because we have more of a ground truth of what was really there. Hearing is more of an illusion but deep neural networks are dreaming, and they'll start to dream sound. I, I'm not sure if that fits into cars. I, I, I don't think it'd be relying on the safety of the car to, to a pair of ears just yet. Um, um, well, so, just yeah. It's going to be a fascinating area. You know, I think deep learning in audio uh, will have, over the next five years, similar impact to, to what it has in vision. Um, Okay, I'm afraid it, it's um, the last question during this session because of time. So, but guys, if you have other questions, you may find Glenn after. Yeah, please. So, and he will be absolutely happy to answer any of your questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Glenn, for a wonderful presentation.